Welcome everybody to the Who Killed Joseph Smith podcast, where we analyze all of the narratives from church history that don't quite make sense. Tonight's guest will be Clark Abood. And, you know, we've been speaking back and forth for quite some time about what we've discovered about the history of Carthage. And I thought he would be the perfect guest to come on and explain what his theory is about what happened in Carthage. What I was surprised to find out is that Clark is not a member of the LDS Church and has never been a member of the LDS Church. So I was wondering, Clark, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, so, so I'm in my 30s right now. And so I was born and raised in Arizona, uh, was raised um, going to basically a, a Protestant, non-denominational church. Um, uh, called CCV out in Arizona, and I it was really shallow. And g- growing up in that, I I was struggling with uh, homosexuality and um, struggling with the concept of you know that if being a Christian is about you know being happy and about you know just being nice. And sometimes I I wasn't happy, and I was like trying to force myself to be happy because it's that, you know, that's what a Christian is supposed to do. And um, my senior year in high school, I ended up uh, losing my faith um, in Christianity altogether o- over the whole homosexual issue. Um, I I struggled with in church with, you know, Romans one about the reprobate. And I just didn't feel like that applied because I was trying to follow Jesus Christ. And um but I had a spiritual experience when I was 14 that made me believe in God. And, um, that's when God intervened in my life when I was about to commit suicide the last day of spring break in um, eighth grade and God, I heard a voice tell me to turn on the radio. I tuned it. Um, and I told it, told me when to stop and, uh, two different songs came on, on two different stations. And it, I felt uh, the Holy spirit come in and, um, free me from those thoughts that were telling me to commit suicide. It was, I felt like I was on air, felt like, like electricity or something, um, per going through me and nothing could make me sad. Wow. Yeah. And then the following day we had a school assembly on suicide prevention and I, I just broke down from that and that I, that could have been me in that discussion that day. What do you think that experience was? Um, so I believe that God has mercy for anyone, regardless of their religious beliefs. I believe God loves everyone and desires all men to come to repentance. And so God will intervene, even with the Holy Spirit. I don't believe you have to be saved for the Holy Spirit to at least influence your life in some way, because God's there to help. So how much is that experience an anchor to your life and regarding, you know, what you do on a day-to-day basis? Um, it's, it's a humbling experience just thinking about that, you know, God would have mercy upon someone like me in that circumstance. And even um, that's what made me to continue believing in God even after leaving Christianity, I, I searched for God in the various world religions, looking for archaeology for any any of them. And, um, you know, I was, I came out as gay after high school and to a few people and it lived in that lifestyle for that a few, for a few, for a few years before God, you know, changed my life and took that away from me. Huh. So how do you get from there to wanting to understand the martyrdom at Carthage? Um, so so I, be, I became a Christian again in 2011, 2012, towards the end of the, the year of 2011. And in 2014, I was considering becoming an associate pastor for a church. And, the, you know, their beliefs didn't quite line up with the, the Bible and 
And I questioned what God wanted me to do with my life because I had a passion for ministry and a passion for, you know, religious discussions. Mm -hmm. And um, I met my wife to be. And so me and her prayed on June 27th of 2014, what he wanted us to do. And he told us to come to Utah. And that day happens to be the anniversary of the martyrdom as well. And where were you living at the time? I was in Tempe, Arizona. And had you ever been to Utah before? No, I've never been to Utah. First time I came to Utah is when we moved out here. So when you prayed and the answer was Utah, what was your reaction? I didn't know anything about Mormons. I'm just going to use the term Mormon just for the sake of the conversation. But I, I confused Mormonism with Jehovah's Witnesses. And mm-hmm. I never really knew any Mormons. I've heard like one or two things about them growing up and I knew a a Jack Mormon in my high school but I didn't have any encounters and then that week I met several uh, Latter-day Saints um, through work and just going around Tempe and stuff so um, on my daily tasks and stuff and so how long ago was it that you moved to Utah I came out here in October of 2019 (laughs) what was it like um it was it was different than i expected um so i began with uh reading mcconkey's mormon doctrine and some of that's how you began (laughs) to figure out what utah is all about is mcconkey's mormon yeah i thought mcconkey and reading the his commentary on the new testament um so i study i read the book of mormon the doctrine covenants and pillar great price front to back um twice um, after talking with the missionaries and meeting with them, because mm-hmm. I just want to understand what the scriptures that um, the Mormon the Mormons use, and um, I wanted to understand the doctrines. And then I started learning about the history from um, Latter Day Saints, from ex Mormons, and from everyone in between. And um, then I began learning about the culture like a year before I came out here, and just um, seeing it in person, you know. Did your wife jump in as much as you? Um, no, uh, it, um, no, she didn't. She left it really all to me to kind of look into, and she, I just pass it on in footnotes for her, kind of when I learned and stuff. So she received the same answer to move to Utah and wasn't confident in that. But did you guys understand why? Why would God want you to do that? Um, it's there's there's just a lot of people out here that are hurting that a lot of people who have a lot of shame and guilt and you know i i had a lot of that in my life as well and yeah but jesus took a lot of that took that shame on that cross for us and there's a lot of people that you know could hear more about jesus's love and to love one one another and him do you feel like you you've been able to help people um, you know, I've shared my whole the whole time I've been out here. We started a congregation, um, but we closed that down um, after three years. And uh, we're planning to uh, move out of Utah to Alabama. But, you know, the last thing I thought I, I should do for people after um, finding more about the circumstances around the martyrdom that I should finish this and let people see it and you know, let that be the last thing I do to really help out the community. That's amazing. So when did you start diving in? Um, I, I, I would say probably around May. Um, I saw your film in June of Mm -hmm. last year. And so I started, the reason I was looking at it was I, I was looking at the authorship of the Book of Mormon and, um, in the book, uh, Book of Commandments, which is what, was made before the Doctrine and Covenants in section 10, verse 10. It it talks about Hiram Smith as a translator of the Golden Plates. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's a little bit different than what the church says now. But um, I thought it was interesting how Joseph and Hiram both died um, as translators of the Golden Plates. Right. And then I was curious about Parley Pratt because I, I was wondering why he sided with Brigham over Sidney Rigdon because Right. Harley was, a, I would say, a decent friend of Rigdon, and I just thought it was a bit unexpected. And 
Just what, Brigham Young. What is the side there? Why would Parley go with Brigham? Um, I mean, I would say um, just for um, Brigham offered more than Rigdon did, uh, probably, and um, maybe Parley wasn't as close to Rigdon as I previously thought. You know. Yeah. What has your experience been with members of the LDS Church as far as how familiar are they with this history? Um, I would say they're overall they're not familiar with any of their history. Um, I, I get the idea that they feel like if they read their history that they'll lose their faith or that if they if if they had faith or believed they wouldn't feel the need to look at it. Hmm. And um, what's your response when you pick pick up on that? Um, I I remember kind of feeling that way um, growing up as a, in high school with my religion, but yeah, I just feel like a lot of members are extremely nominal in their faith. They're not very devoted as right. far as like knowing doctrine or history, because that those are things that are more prominent. You would say in Protestant and other right. Um, you know, Christendom, like where the focus is on some of those things rather than on the culture. Um, so you find that other Christian religions um, dive into their history more than the LDS? Is that what you're saying? Um, some do. Anabaptists, Catholics do. I'd say some Protestants more into their doctrine than Mormons do. I'd say a lot of Mormons remind me of sort of like a Joel Osteen kind of seeker sensitive mm -hmm. kind of uh church where it's not it, a lot of its emotion or um experiences rather than like ha being having gr uh, gratification from you know learning about the history or learning more about God or whatever it may be right why do you uh, think yeah. that is it's amazing it's an amazing I mean, outside observation. Um, well, the focus is on revelation rather than, you know, scripture. Um, it doesn't seem like a lot of members have maybe read the entire Doctrine of Covenants or Book of Mormon front to back. And um, I can't really say because I've never been LDS, but um, yeah, I, I guess the focus is more on experiencing like joy and in you know the church large church life and hmm. all that so when did you figure out the the martyrdom anniversary was on the date that you received your answer to come to utah um i i learned i realized that about a year afterwards hmm. but it didn't really uh it didn't really come to me until like um, last year that maybe this is an important reason for that happening that day wow. and what really helped motivate me more to even start to look at it so recently you finished a 42 page research paper outlining all of the details or many of the details that you found regarding the martyrdom and surrounding the events of the martyrdom um a lot of people can read that and just be overwhelmed with how much information there is. How did you even approach it? How did you begin? Um, so, so I'm a, I'm autistic, and so a lot of I have I have pretty good memory as far as like remembering a lot of things. So I started by I started looking at just the history and things that just didn't feel right to me, and I just take put a little note of it in a Word doc. And just um, continue reading through the history and just throw things here and there. And then over time, just kind of put it into a timeline and try and organize my thoughts and then ask questions like who, where, why, how, um, what are the various explanations for or interpretations of why this happened? Was there certain yeah. books that you liked that you were going to or just online sources um, or anything you can get your hands on? One of the books, it's a mention in the um in my paper. It's the life and songs or whatever of W.W. W. Phelps. Uh W.W. W. Phelps following his story helped outline the martyrdom and 
just learning about his uh his 1838 um where he testified against joseph smith and got joseph the trees in charge and after the martyrdom like the special um things that brigham did for phelps and yeah. the the weird things that go against you know the policy that phelps was benefiting from right phelps having your paper for me you do not seem like a fan of phelps um i i was a bit suspicious of phelps as i was reading through it and just he's in too many places like that happened to benefit brigham young and them and also around murders so just the the death of um don carlos smith joseph's brother and then robert thompson in the time right. seasons um he's around when um he's associated with the death of joseph and hiram through having the expositor destroyed and pushing joseph to commit the act of treason with the martial law and the speeches and everything that he did and then he was helping willard richards with keeping samuel smith from taking leadership and until you know he his death there so so do you think joseph was oblivious to all of this or why did he let phelps come back into his life Multiple. so so um so i'm obviously i don't i don't believe that joseph is a prophet um so from my perspective i see joseph as someone who wanted the benefit of the doubt for a lot of people and um you could look at um who was the person that he worked with with translating the book of mormon first it was um that martin lost the, martin harris with martin harris when he lost the the 160 30, 60 something pages and just joseph you know being merciful with him to some degree and um with oliver cowdery and Jen, john c bennett and everyone else like he wanted people to stay with him you know he, he he seemed to be someone that cared about community and even when william law was left was excommunicated from the church joseph still wanted him back in and hmm. had phelps right to um, william law to come back do you consider that a strength or a weakness um well i would see brigham young as because brigham young um talks about joseph smith like that was his mistake. That's I'm not going to be like Joseph. I'm going to look out for number one. Right. So mm -hmm. um, I I feel like God, Jesus tells us to be wise as serpents and as innocent as doves. So I think that's the best. Yeah, we person. should be forgiving. Yeah, but that doesn't necessarily mean invite them into your back yeah. into your life, right? But yeah, a lot of people have that observation for joseph that he was too you know like you said he was too merciful if that's possible to be too merciful and let these guys to let these guys surround him and yeah. burn him and then he let him come back and yeah it's very interesting so let's get a little bit into um what with your paper and the PowerPoint and the people you've engaged with on Carthage, what's been the response? Um, well, the the best response have been people that, you know, still believe Joseph to be a prophet and believe in the Book of Mormon. Um, they're willing to consider it and look at in the what I cited and everything. Um, the so, some LDS will not even bother looking at the at the paper, saying I saw just uh, Justin Griffin's film Who Killed Joseph, and it's, this paper is just going to be a parody of it or just a repeat of it. Um, and then others will are looking at it right now, so I haven't heard back from them as far as their response on it. Right. Um, Ex Mormon community, um, some of them are like I don't care about Joseph. He did all these evil things with polygamy and whatever right and others are willing to hear about it because they they want justice for joseph have you ever reached out to any of the other christian denominations or is it just something they would not really care about um i shared with a few people i know but um i don't know how interested they are in it 
um right now i'm i'm just i just want everyone to at least be able to see it and uh judge it for themselves and ultimately have law enforcement look at the rest of it let me ask you very clearly okay if do do you believe it was an inside job yes if it was an inside job what are the ramifications of that to this massive LDS church today with 15 plus million members across the world? Um, well, I don't think you could go the perspective of, you know, oh, King David killed, you know, for Bathsheba. I feel like that wouldn't fly. I, I think most members would see that Brigham and John Taylor couldn't be um, the people who held the keys of the kingdom um after justice murder um honestly people who believe in joseph they either they would look to some of the the other successors like rigdon or um or joseph smith's son through right. emma's church or possibly uh i don't think um never mind yeah i would say those two people probably okay so what is your position as a Christian on this idea that the LDS church puts so much weight into these keys and that's where their authority comes from that makes them the true church? Well, I believe, I believe in apostolic secession. That's why I'm Anabaptist. Mm -hmm. I believe uh, Jesus established the Anabaptist church in the first century and it, it retained its apostolic keys so I, I I would agree that you can't just say um, this church, some church came about by some man's authority and without God's authority. So it's important that there's some claim to authority from Jesus himself. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, let's just get into it. What do you think happened at Carthage? Um, so my perspective is that um, the idea to kill Joseph began as early as early as November of 1843, as far as the plot to kill him in Carthage. So I believe W.W. Uh, w. Phelps and Jonathan Dunham of the Nauvoo Legion, uh, as they began meeting with Governor Ford in November of that year, um, began working out an idea of how to get Joseph out of the Nauvoo Legion. Uh, Governor Ford seems interested in having Brigham as the new leader of the Nauvoo Legion, as Governor Ford is the one who appoints Brigham in that position in September of 1844. So my perspective is that um, W.W. W. Phelps pushes Joseph to run for president, and with that, W.W. W. Phelps has more power in city council to push Joseph to commit a crime and or at least get him arrested or to trial. And that would be through the expositor, which was announced um, in May of 1844 in a newspaper prior to Brigham Young leaving Nauvoo. So you're saying that Phelps used the expositor to get Joseph into trouble? Yes, I think he knew that he could provoke William Law to do that. Weren't you saying in your paper that um, Phelps is the one that was quoting the law that would explain why it was okay to destroy that press? Yes, he quoted, he talked about the Boston Tea Party as the justification for destroying the printing press. And it was his action doing that that pushed the city council to make joseph destroy the expositor okay so you're and you're saying he worked with law for law to print i don't believe william law was working with phelps i believe he he knew by provoking william law that law would do that because law had the money to do it okay okay so the expositor is destroyed um one of the things I always wondered is how about is how quickly people outside of Nauvoo heard about that and freaked out and were ready to send huge militias in. 
to address it. I'm like, why do they care what happened in Nauvoo? Or how did they even hear it that quickly? Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I'm like, I do, I do wonder if there's a chance that there was some guys that were feeding that information to the enemies of the church to whip them into a frenzy. Because it just seems like they were mobilized too quickly to me. I believe Governor Ford had the idea in mind with Phelps that th this would happen. And that's why Governor Ford got involved so quickly. Okay. So Joseph was leaving. He was fleeing. And yes, Iowa. Yeah. Who talked him into coming back? Uh, WW Phelps talked him to come back as long as, as well as uh, Leonoid. I'm not sure how to pronounce his name. Cahoon. Cahoon, right. Reynolds. Yeah. Cahoon, right. Yeah, Reynolds Cahoon. And so do you think that those two guys are was Reynolds in on it as well? Or for Paul, um Paul Joseph. The, according to the city count the uh according to the Council of 50, some members believed Cahoon was involved in conspiring with Missouri for the martyrdom. Hmm. So I think it's possible. Okay, so Joseph goes to Carthage. Do you think he expected to be held or do you think he expected to just pay bail and be able to come back? Um, there was no reason for him to believe he would be in prison because of habeas corpus. So the the riot charge would have been bail. Treason was the only reason to keep him in that jail. Which he, he had no him. idea that that charge. No, was he was rearrested in, in the Hamilton Hotel for that uh, treason right. charge. So what about all the people who say he knew? I think Phelps is one of the main ones that wrote Joseph knew, or, you know, I'm going as a lamb to the slaughter. Yes, um, I believe Phelps was the one that wrote that. He also talks about uh, Joseph's last dream. And I don't think that's an actual dream that Joseph had. Really? The one with the barn? Um, where he's on a boat with, I okay. think, Hiram or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, the have you read the barn dream? Um, I don't believe I have. Ah, oh, it's fascinating. He um goes to a dilapidated barn, his barn that he knows well, and all these guys come and try to take the barn over, and he's just like, whatever. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's very symbolic of what was about to happen to him. So he goes to Carthage. Um this charge of treason is levied against him you cannot bail out of that yeah so he's held over and first he's gonna stay in the hamilton hotel they talked about that but from what i read governor ford wanted to stay there and send joseph to the carthage jail yeah like i think they convinced him because joseph's like why am i going to jail and they're like you'll be safer there uh -huh. This was an all stone building it had which is weird because out. Governor Ford sends a letter a few days later telling the jailer to keep Joseph in the, the less secure room in the jailer's bedroom. Right. So that was Ford. I didn't know that. I thought yeah, that Governor was Ford sent, that sent the letter on the day before the murders for him to stay in that room. Hmm. So Joseph is now locked up with his brother Hiram. And it wasn't until the 29th that they were going to come to trial. And they were supposed to have trial on the, I believe it was the 26th, but it was postponed to the 29th, the 29th. by Robert Smith, the, the captain of the Carthage Grace. So what do you think about that policy that guys can come in and out of the jail and visiting and being with them and they can, you know, be hanging out in the room, eating, whatever. Was that the way that all they dealt with all criminals back then? Or did, do you think they knew that he wasn't really guilty? Why did they allow that? Um, I'm not entirely sure. Um, I don't know the historical context of that. What I find concerning as far as the jail is when they are taken to Carthage jail, none of the men are searched for weapons when they enter the jail. Right. And that's because Governor Ford escorts them there and governor ford states himself i did not search them for weapons right and so um that's a current concerning thing so why if someone if governor ford or robert smith the cap captain of the uh carthage grays wants them dead as members of the anti-mormon party 
why are they allowing them to have weapons in the first right. place? Yeah, and and everybody's passing the blame on that one after the words about who was supposed to check them and who didn't. And Ford, in his final memoir, says that I was blamed for this, but it's not my fault. That was someone else's responsibility. Yeah, but, which is interesting. So they're in the jail. Um, as you know, the part that I concentrate on is the yeah. two three minutes when the mob shows up. Mm -hmm. Have you got a timeline of events in your mind of how you think those two to three minutes played out? Um, yes. Um, so I believe it took, I believe it took about nine, eight to nine minutes that, that whole circumstance. Um, so how, do you, how are you coming up with that eight to nine minutes? All right. So eight to nine minutes would be because of Hiram was shot in the back and the legs post-mortem and for him not to bleed out it takes about eight to nine minutes for him to have bled out through the the mouth and nose oh, okay. so he was shot in the back um at the very end of that that situation because the mob returns upstairs as mentioned by jonathan uh john taylor hit by thomas bullock and is the right you agree with gary smith on that assessment um yeah so after the fact yeah so he, i believe they the mob went upstairs shot him in the back with the pistol and then shot him in his um right leg and then they flipped his body over and shot him in the left lower leg because the left lower leg is in the front the back and the right thigh is in the back of the the body right and so when the or that or, what happened <laughs> and when the corner and um Mr. Hamilton's son walked into the room. They saw Hiram on his back, not on his stomach at that point in time. Right. Yeah. So what happened before that? All right. So let, let's see if we agree on things. So okay. the mob came from Warsaw. The Warsaw militia was called off by the governor. Yeah. He takes his militia to Nauvoo to go and, you know... He says he was looking for counterfeit money there. Um, maybe he was going to go make a stand to say, don't you guys think about doing anything crazy here? But he leaves the Carthage Grays in charge of the jail. And he tells the militia from Warsaw, back off. And those guys were already halfway. Yeah, he just he, he, uh, let them go in a very bad place for Joseph. Yeah. Yes. And then sharp is like heck no we're not disbanding let's go get him and from what i can tell most of the members of that mob were like i'm not doing that like he, one of his main guys was like he's in jail why would we go kill a guy in jail that's the most cowardly thing ever but sharp is just yelling out of all of them and he gets sharp is 26 at the time i believe and he gets a bunch of the younger guys you know to follow them how many people do you think were in that mob um i don't have any judgments on that yeah okay so willard is all over the place he says 150 to 250 then changes it to 100 to 102 yeah. then i think he settles around 150 lots of people different numbers from 100 to 200 but only one guy William Daniels, which I know you like his accounts. Yeah, I believe William Daniels over most people. He said eight, 84 is how many. Oh, yeah. So I don't know. Is there a big difference in your mind between 84 people and 150 people? Um, I don't think it really matters as much if you're just considering how many people are going up the stairs and sh supposedly right. shooting through the window. Yeah. So these Guys from the Warsaw militia, you know, supposedly get communication from the Carthage Grays. The mm -hmm. Carthage Grays put six guys in front of the jail to guard it. Yeah. But their main body is a couple hundred yards away in the center of town camping yeah, out. They're off and they can't get there in time. Yeah. And they put Hamilton, I think, up in the bell tower and say, just look out. If anything crazy happens, let us know. So he's the one that alerted them and the Carthage Grays come running towards Carthage. But the guards that were at the jail 
when the mob comes up, are those guards in on it or not? Is the question. So I would say they are. So they they would have to know that Stephen uh that um Stephen Markham and Dan Jones are no longer at the jail present with Joseph and Hiram. And that would be through Governor Ford who put up the you cannot enter the jail. Because Dan Jones mentions in his account that Governor Ford didn't allow Stephen Markham or him to return back and only allowed Willard Richards in and out of the jail. And then Robert Smith, the the justice of the peace who postponed the the trial for Joseph and allowed them to have guns in the jail. Um, he would be probably the person involved with coordinating the mob on behalf of John Taylor and Willard Richards. So I always thought that those six Carthage Grays were coordinating with the mob because, you know, they shot their guns. Many people testified that they shot their guns, but they didn't hit anybody. Yeah. So they were shot over their heads, which would suggest, you know, they were in on it. Because how do you miss 85 yeah. to 150 people? And other people say they loaded their guns with blanks. But there's an account by Eudosha Marsh where her brother was one of the one of the guards and he was fighting against the mob. Mm-hmm. And he was a younger guy, I think 18 or 19 or something like that. Mm-hmm. And he's like, you're not getting in here. And they're holding him down, screaming at him, saying, what are you doing? Don't be crazy. We're not here to get you. You're yeah. fine. So that tells me they weren't all in on it. Some yeah. of them for sure were, but not all of them were. But the captain, for sure. That's why I think Robert Smith is so important into this in the right. story. Yeah. So I don't know if the mob came in thinking a few of them were on their side or if all the Carthage Grays were on their side. So I don't know if the Carthage Grays were a threat to them or not, or if, or not, but my guess is that the mob didn't know. And so they were on edge about that. They, there was so many unknowns. Yeah. So anyway, they push the guards out of the way and then they yell out to the jailer Stigler, release the prisoners to us. Mm -hmm. And the jailer says, I'm not going to do that. Do we agree so far? Yeah. Okay. So then they push their way into the jail and up the stairs. How many guys do you believe actually went in the jail? Um, At least a, f- a few of them. Because um, William Daniels mentions seeing them come out of that jail mm-hmm. afterwards. After Joseph falls out of the window. So... At least at least five, if not more. So if you were raised in the LDS church and you've ever talked about Carthage and you've looked at paintings, it's always this huge mass of guys with their faces painted yeah. black with all of these muskets. I mean, we were taught to believe that there was a huge crowd of guys that went into the jail. And come to find out, that doesn't match the record at all. Well, I can't remember if is it the Lion Brothers or how do you pronounce their name? They yeah. they talk about only three or so people and at the head of the stairs that could fire because of the space that's there. Right. I don't know if they agree that there was. Yes, maybe they said that three. I don't remember if they were saying. They, I, I remember reading like three people could be. But they were they were the ones saying that the mob was. They believe there's 35 shots into that room, which I don't know if you've ever shot a black powder rifle, but I can tell you now within a couple of minutes, it takes forever to reload the dang thing. Yeah. And so what what the Lion Brothers suggested was they were switching guns up and back and forth, up and down the stairs. They would shoot it, pass it down, grab a new one. And that's how they were able to get that many shots in the room. I don't know if I agree. I don't think I agree with that. My opinion is the the shots in the room are from John Taylor and Willard and the the two shots through the door are from the mob. But I believe the mob shot through the door after John and Willard had left the room to go into the cell room. Ah, okay. So we see that's where the timing is different. Yeah, We see that differently. So let me get your point of view. Okay, so we agree that five or six guys at most go into the jail. And that's what Brackenberry testified in court. As he said, it was half a dozen. He's the only one that I've ever seen okay. gave a number on how many went. Other people said they saw the guys going in and out, but he's the yeah. only one that actually gave a number. 
Do you have a feeling for how old those guys were that went in the jail? Um, I, I know you talked about them being young. I haven't looked at their ages. So again, yeah, a lot of people think this was some precision military strike, you know, that was completed by their top generals who understand how to do this kind of stuff. And I'm like, that's not what the record says. The record says that they were younger guys and the leaders of the mob. I mean, Sharp was only 26 himself. He was outside almost like daring them to go in, get in there. Mm -hmm. You know, they gave him liquor to get. Yeah. I mean, we've both been young guys before. You know how easy it is for someone to whip you into a frenzy. Yeah. And get you all hyped up in a moment and tell you these guys are murderers and they're the worst people. And, you know, you can just, I can see how you can get youth to do that, to run into that jail. Now, when they get to the top of the stairs, do you believe that door was shut? Um, I believe that Joseph had already left the room and confronted them at the stairs. Tell me why. All right. So Lion Brothers mentions that the gunshot through the lat door latch um, happened when the door was open. Um, so in 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 your film, you 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 have them pressed up uh, pressed up against the door, and someone fires through that door. Um, so if they're in that in that room, they're going to have the door shut. They're not going to have the door cracked or open for that door latch shot to happen with it open you know because there's no da damage to the door um right. jab or frame or whatever you call it correct correct so it makes the most sense that those gunshots through the door happen afterwards after joseph and Hiram were already dead and so um for for everyone to for john taylor to have murdered Hiram and everything for that to, for it to happen that way it makes the most sense for joseph to be out of the room mm -hmm. um to confront them at the at the head of the stairs and when he shoots at them he strikes two men in the shoulder and one in the face and so they would be somewhat lined up when he shoots them and shooting them in the stairway would help with getting those shots in are they firing back at him in your um I don't believe they fired at him because Joseph was only shot four to five times and he was, and those four shots happened at the well. So, so if he came out of the room and fired at them, they took off and back. Yeah. Maybe they didn't have their weapons loaded when Joseph confronted them, but he shot them um, with, I believe with two bullets from his six shooter and okay. they, they retreated back inside. They remained in the building, but they um, weren't at the stairs at that point. You said two. You mentioned three wounds earlier. Yeah, so I believe one passed through two people. Okay. Yeah. So he fired twice and struck three people. Got it. So while he's out there on the stairwell in this battle with the guys that came into the jail, what's yeah. happening in the room? Um, I believe Hiram is over near the east wall um he's looking out of the east window and john taylor comes up from behind him and puts him in a um a chokehold in um a silent hold or whatever where he does this because he doesn't want Hiram to call out and it's probably the more viable option of getting someone down and killing them um, as Willie Richards mentions to the coroner that Hiram died from a broken neck and not from blood loss or getting shot in the head or whatever. So, you know, why does Willard Richards mention the, the broken neck and why why is the gunshot to John Taylor's uh, thigh in the left leg? And I, I feel like the best explanation is Hiram is holding, trying to get air and holding uh, John Taylor's arm and using his left hand to shoot um, John John Taylor in that left in that left thigh as John is directly behind him. Right. Yeah. Okay. So the mob didn't shoot into the room at all. They shot into the room after everything. At, right at the yeah. beginning. Joseph's out firing. 
inside john taylor grabs hiram from behind yeah do you believe the sh the shots to hiram's head do you believe the one shot theory yeah i believe it came from under his jaw because he died face down facing the east wall if he there's no way that bullet would pass through the door and move around his body to hit him because okay. so his back was to the door when he died the east window is the opposite of the door. Yeah, the, door the door's on the west side. the The east wall is. You know, Where's Willard? Willard Richards, I believe, is in the door hinges. Okay, he's hiding behind the door. Yeah, and then Hiram falls to the ground dead, and yeah. then the door opens and Joseph comes back in. Um, I believe John Taylor shoots a few rounds into the west wall. So okay. for that, those lower bullets that are way too low for anyone from outside to have made. So, because so John Taylor, the morning of the murders, he uh, during breakfast, he stays upstairs by himself. And okay. so I think he spent that that hour by himself upstairs getting weapons loaded up and placed mm -hmm. in the room where he needed it. So John Taylor fires back at Joseph when he comes in the room. Does he hit him? I don't believe John Taylor shot Joseph. Joseph has four four wounds. William Daniel says he was shot four times at the well. I don't believe Joseph was shot in that room at all. So John Taylor's firing at him. What does Joseph do now? Um, I believe John Taylor shoots into the, the west wall. Joseph okay. enters the room and shoots John Taylor three times. In the left side of his body, the wrist, the yep. the hip, and the knee. Okay. And John Taylor goes under the bed? He goes under the bed, yes. Okay. Now what happens? Um, I believe Joseph goes to the body of Hiram. Okay. And then he, re he remembers that Willard Richards is in the room. I believe Joseph shoots his last round at Willard Richards and hits him in the left ear lobe. Uh, Willard Richards says he got that wound from standing in the window after Joseph fell from okay. and from musket fire. Okay. William Daniels says no one shot at Joseph in the window and did not shoot through that window at that period in time. So I believe Willard Richards is lying about the origin of his ear because uh, okay. he was shot by Joseph. So Joseph sh shoots three rounds into um john taylor yeah one round into or well, one Richards. towards willard that nicks his ear yeah now joseph is out of bullets and higher yeah. today now what happens i believe uh willard richards has stephen markham's cane and fractures joseph's skull with it and with joseph disorientated he pushes him out the window and joseph remains disoriented until he's at the well as William Daniel states. Fascinating. And do you think Richards could have lifted Joseph and got him out of that window on his own? Um, William Daniels describes Joseph in the window with both the, with trying to hold in, hold himself into the room with right. his two left, his two arms on one side of the window and his two legs on the other, trying to hold himself in with his back kind of hanging out of the window right so um i believe joseph was trying to stay in the room but willie richards was pushing him out and so um uh Hamil hamilton's son mentions seeing joseph come to the the window twice um mm -hmm. and so i i see joseph like considering maybe i should get out of this room with willie richards here but he tries to take on willie richards and gets his skull fractured so you don't think Willard had a gun? Um, I believe Willie Richards could have had a gun, but the skull, but Joseph was not shot when he left that when he fell out of that window, according to William Daniels. So the mob that went into the jail and Joseph fired at them and they left the jail. Why do you think in their minds aren't they asking why would Joseph jump out of this window? Um, 
I don't know if they were really thinking that much ahead. I think they were just happy that they could kill Joseph. Mm -hmm. um, and because they because they still care about going up into that room eventually, like after all the gunfire ceases. Right. And Willie Richard and John Taylor are in that cell room. They I believe they shot through that door and entered in and seeing Hiram, they shot him in the back with a pistol in the leg and then flipping him over and shooting him in the leg again. So after they shoot Joseph, then some of them come back up the stairs and into the room. And that's where they fire into Hiram's back and legs, correct? Yeah. So the, the wounds to his back and his legs, there's no exit wounds in them, which suggests a lower caliber. And there's no burn marks on his clothes there. So it's a pistol, not a, a musket. And why do you believe they don't finish off John Taylor and Willard in the room? Um, it, I mean, they could have easily followed John Taylor's blood trail to the cell room, but I, I don't believe they were there for John or Willie Richards. You think they were hiding in the other cell and they came into the room and there was just Hiram there, correct? That, that's what John Taylor states that Thomas Bullock recorded. Yeah. Okay. So now comes the hard question. Mm -hmm. um, two accounts of mob members going into the jail said that they shot through the door and that shot hit Hiram in the face. Why would they say that if that's not how, if that didn't happen? They could have believed that they killed Joseph Smith first and then killed Hiram second because I believe Will Richards and John left that room, that door room cracked at least. And the mob shot through that door, um, that open door at the latch in the door and in that one spot there. And finding Hiram dead on the floor, they believed that they shot him in the head. Okay, so uh, Hiram is on the floor the dead. The door is closed. They come back up, fire through the door and think that shot hit Hiram. Yeah, like if you like, say you shot a door, you shot through it, and there's a dead person already there, would you open the door and be like, oh my gosh, I killed that person? Well, that's what I'm wondering is you're saying they didn't fire into the room at all before Joseph chased him out. So I'm like, how the heck did they think Hiram, that they killed Hiram if they never even fired into that room? And when they come back up, he's already dead. But you're saying the door was closed. So the door was partially closed. They shot through it. They enter the room and then they shoot Hiram those three times after believing they shot him in the head with that door shot. Okay. Yeah. So do you think the two shots that are in the door in Carthage today are authentic? Like, do you think um, the door is the original? From what movie? I've read, yeah, they are authentic. Okay. So... Where did all of the other shots in the wall, on the west wall, how many shots do you think there were in that wall? Um, I mean, Joseph's lawyer says 35 shots in the room altogether. Um, I believe with six shooters, John Taylor could have made several of those shots in that west wall. Okay. And, so, okay. So I can't say. I believe that John Taylor only got one shot on Hiram, so he still had five shots left. Um, yeah, he had five shots left and then whatever guns he had around because John Taylor mentions having two pistols with him on June 21st in at the Hamilton Hotel. Right. And that, you know, that's a few days prior to Carthage jail, but presumably we can believe that he brought those pistols with him to Carthage that he had. You previously. believe John Taylor shot all five of shots? At Joseph and missed five times. I don't believe they all went into the wall. I believe no, no, I believe John Taylor shot into the room with just him and Willard Richards and a dead Hiram to start staging the room. I don't think he shot at Joseph Smith. Got it. Very I cool. think Joseph waited until John was out had the reload just before he shot John and entered that room. It's a new theory, man, and it's pretty cool. I and think the reason why I say that is it doesn't really make sense for them to shoot into that west wall after Joseph's out of that window. Right. Just because you would have William Daniels or some other eyewitness say 
there is still shooting going on in that room after Joseph falls out. It, from the eyewitnesses, it really seems like all the shooting in that room ceased once Joseph fell from the window. Right. From your study of the materials and what you've produced, how confident are you in your theory? I'm... I'm I'm a hundred percent confident that it was an inside job, um, and the reasons why that are mentioned in the paper as well with cit uh, citations is that two days after the expositor is destroyed, Phelps announces the new DNC, and when Joseph's dead, he takes out a part that prevents Brigham from taking leadership, um, showing premeditation, and that Phelps expected Joseph to be dead within a month. Willard Richards and John Taylor on the 22nd of June. Um, Willard Richards stops journaling for Joseph in his journal, which he did daily for a year and a half, starts doing and writing his own journal. And John, John Taylor sends a bunch of printing press equipment east and change, spends hours adjusting the accounting books um, prior to them being searched for counterfeiting, which federal marshals come after them a year later. Right. Um, and then Brigham Young, he has a changing story about him having the endowment or not. Um, he adds that he cried after learning the news of Joseph Smith's murder several years after the fact in altering journals. And for him and Phelps to be on the same page about the last charge that Joseph gave him, it gave the endowments, it shows that Brigham and Phelps had to have a conversation prior to the murders about that. How many guys do you think were in on the inside job? Um, so the only people who are necessary for the murders of Joseph and Hiram are Phelps, uh, Brigham Young, John Taylor, Willard Richards, Governor Ford, and Robert Smith. Um, I believe Hosea Stout um, knew about the murder of Samuel Smith. Um, so Will Willard Richards, um, after the murders, he prevents Samuel Smith from taking leadership because Samuel is the next in charge. Okay. And he writes licenses under the authority of the 12 apostles, showing and demonstrating knowledge that will, uh, Samuel Smith would be dead prior to Brigham Young coming back. Because hmm. there, there's no reason for you to sign licenses when you know the next person in charge is going to be. Yeah. Have you put any thought into what kind of testing you could do to try and prove or, you know, add more weight to your theory? Um, well, the, ne the next step from here is anyone adding on to the history and your work on the forensics. Um, my ultimate goal is for the Illinois law enforcement to exhume John Taylor for the bullet in his leg to find out the caliber and see if they can match the tool markings left on it to the pistol that is claimed to be used by Joseph Smith. Tell me how you're trying to accomplish that. Um, I, I created a petition right now. Last time I checked, we have 127 signatures. And so I'm going to be sending my the case file that I created with the probable cause um, to the law enforcement and the Attorney General of Illinois. And with all the petition signatures showing there is support for this so that they have a reason to open up. Uh, that. Have you spoken with anyone there about this so far or you're waiting to? Uh, I've talked to lower, like smaller police departments within Illinois, and they talked about the issue as time and, you know, budget. And so that's why I believe the petition is so important for them to consider doing this and creating that case file so they can go to court to get a court order for the exhuming John Taylor. If you exhume his body, what are you thinking you'll find? Well, I believe you'll find the bullet in his knee that was never removed. And you'll possibly see marking on the markings on the bone of a skeleton from that day when the bullet bounced off the left thigh bone. Do you, what would it mean if there's no ball in there? Um, well, there, what do you mean no ball? You dig up, you exhume his body and there is no ball in his leg in the casket there. Well, there would be a bullet 
there's no mention anywhere that he removed it. And in 1854 is when he says it was still in his leg. So right. 10 years after the fact. And there, I didn't find any mentions that post-mortem after John Taylor died, anyone cut his leg apart to find a, the bullet. So if you found a ball and somehow, do you think the LDS church would let you analyze the it would secure? it would be law enforcement doing okay. it they would have authority to do it and if you found that the ball in john taylor's leg matched joseph's six shooter if they could somehow pull that off what would that mean to you? um if the markings lined up together it would show that joseph shot john taylor in self-defense and then that is part of the the cause of the probable cause that John and Willard were involved in the murders. Do you There's think that that was convince members of the church that it was an inside job? Oh, what was that? Do you think that that evidence, that physical evidence would convince members of the LDS church that it was an inside job? Well, you were, you and other people were convinced on less just on circumstantial. So, right. Uh, this would be direct evidence and there's other things out there that could provide direct evidence that remain intact that i want to talk about cool um like what uh, i don't want to mention it okay yeah so do you feel like you've covered some of the reasons for motivation or do you have anything you'd like to add about the motivation for why these guys would do this um the motivation that i came to was um, Brigham cared about the tithing fund. Um, he talks about um, that he would take things from the tithing fund that he felt was useful. For, and he was put in charge of the Nauvoo Temple Fund. Um, and that's what tithing fund he would have had access to. Um, and then in Utah, he took over a million dollars from the tithing fund and never repaid it back at the point of his death. Right. Um, Brigham Young also mentions that he was sick and tired of Joseph and other people telling him what to do. He wanted to be his own boss. And he writes to his wife, he's tired of traveling. And as a part of the apostles of the 12, that was their duty. They were sent out. They weren't some high council in Nauvoo or anything like that. Right. Um, and then the, the, mon the counterfeiting money. Um, federal marshals came after him for that. Governor Ford tried to protect Brigham Young from ch earlier charges of counterfeiting. And you find suspicious behavior like John Taylor sending printing equipment east and pr printing equipment for the DNC in the U.S. goes missing. And so they have to import the Doctrine and Covenants from England. It's your contention that Brigham didn't flee Nauvoo because of mob persecution. It was because they were about to get busted for counterfeiting. Yeah, they were going after him for counterfeiting in December of 1845, and that's the reason they left. Right. Awesome. Um, the, last, the last reason would be polygamy. So I believe Joseph Smith did practice polygamy, but I don't believe he practiced it to the point that the Elias Church claims. And, you know, and Honestly, the idea that he didn't practice polygamy is it would be a great idea. Um, the reason why I believe he's polygamist is William Marx um, talks about that Joseph came to him before his murder and said, um, I'm done with polygamy. Um, I want to basically ex excommunicate people for practicing it. Right. And, you know, I, I have a hard time understanding how members in the LDS church defend Joseph marrying other men's wives and um, how Emma is like the 20th woman sealed to Joseph for time and eternity. Like, why isn't Emma number one for right. being sealed to Joseph? And, you know, Joseph saying to uh, Kimball's daughter, like, if you don't marry me, an angel will kill me with a flaming sword and all that. So how do how do you make the connection that the narrative about martyrdom is totally wrong and a cover up, but not that the story that they told about Joseph's polygamy could have been the same thing? I believe that some of 
justice polygamy probably isn't true. That's what I'm saying. Um, but William Marks to me seems like a very trusted source. He's not he's not a pro Brigham Young, and I don't see him having any motivation for saying because Emma Emma in an interview she's the one that says Joseph didn't practice polygamy at all. Right. William Marks would have more of a a reason to say Joseph didn't do it whatsoever, but he says that Joseph did participate in it. Um, obviously, polygamy is not something I've studied heavily in. Right. Um, it is interesting in that William Marks quote that Joseph said, "If I try and you know shut these guys down on polygamy, they'll kill me," and he was worried about that. Did you see that? Um, I. It, I read, I went through a lot and so sometimes I don't remember everything that Got I put it. down in that paper, but yeah. Clark, this has been an amazing uh, conversation. I can't believe how much work you've done. Um, what's your feelings about Joseph Smith at this point from all of your study? Well, he's not a prophet, but how do you feel about him? So God told me that I'm to love everyone. I'm to love my neighbors as myself. And that's part of, that's the reason why I did this. You know, I did this out of an act of love for Joseph Smith. Um, Sure. I, I don't believe him as a prophet and I feel like he deceived people, but at the end of the day, his life, he, he was made in the image of God and it doesn't matter who is murdered. That person should have justice for whoever murdered them you know it should be known if Brigham Young murdered Joseph Smith through via other people um then it that legacy should be understood and that he did that you know right how can people get a hold of you how can they sign your petition if they want to support you um will you be able to post the link in the description or with with the paper as well it's with hemlock knots in youtube in the description they allow you to do that yeah yeah we'll do okay. that great so we'll put that link in the description where you can reach out to cork and ask him any questions you can get access to the study the paper that he did and you can sign that petition any last words clark would you like to share with the audience um thank you for uh letting me on and i hope we get more i hope we get justice for joseph and um get to the truth of it all. Me too. Thanks, man. Thank you, everybody, for joining us for this episode of Who Killed Joseph Smith, the podcast. Have a good one. Mm -hmm.